Porter Moser put out the message to Sooner Nation. Really, he's been doing it since he arrived in Norman, but he put out the message ahead of a, a big marquee game against Texas on ESPN on Tuesday night. Fill up the Lloyd Noble Center, and the Sooner Nation, Sooner Nation did. OU fans came out in droves to see OU try to, you know, to knock off Texas, make another statement win. But instead, OU falls flat with a 75-60 to 60 loss to the Longhorns uh, in front of a, a rowdy Lloyd Noble Center crowd, a game that OU led at halftime and trailed by just one point midway through the second half before – just running out of gas and, and, and Texas, you know, ju just ran away with the game. I think it was a game that, that um, was pretty disappointing in a lot of ways. Not only was it a chance for, for OU to continue their upward trajectory, but it was also a way to continue building momentum within the fan base. Instead, kind of back to the drawing board a little bit. If you're Oklahoma, we're here to break that down and break down what last night's mean, what last night's loss means for this Sooners team what it means moving forward. This is another episode of In the Paint, an OU men's basketball show fueled by OU Insider and the Rivals Network. I am Jesse Crittenden. I am joined, as always, by Brody Lusk. And Brody, last night, I think in a lot of ways, was kind of the experience of OU season in a nutshell. Really good things, battled through some adversity, but some season-long trends that have been there that have bitten them a couple of times – kind of came back to haunt them what what was you know what what was your takeaway from what was a, a pretty disappointing loss last night at the Lloyd Noble Center yeah that loss to me it came down to one two or it came down to two things first of all they were tra or they were trailing 55 to 54 at the 11 minute mark and they ended the game with 60 points you're not going to win any game in big 12 play if you don't score more than if, if they score six points in the last 10 minutes it, that's just, you know, first of all, that, that it's going to be impossible to win doing that. Uh, and then another aspect I think Oklahoma, they just got dominated in was three-point shooting. Texas, they shot 44% from behind the arc, and Oklahoma shot 21%. And I want to say in that second half, Texas actually shot like in the 50s. And so Max Amos had 20 points. Dylan DeSue had 19 and then you had uh, the Weaver, Chindel Weaver, who hasn't scored over 10 points once this season, and he scored 11. So Texas, they just they just d dominated Oklahoma down the stretch of that game. And the Sooners kind of came out and they started out very poorly, which that's not the first time that has happened this season. That's kind of becoming a trend. Um and then, you know, Jalen Moore kind of got kind of got it going. And I, you were there, so you can probably speak to the, the crowd a lot better than I can. But it seemed like the LNC was rocking kind of throughout the second half or the first half. And then the second half comes and they just got blown out. Porter Porter mentioned it after the game. He I mean, he apologized. He said, I apologize to Sooner Nation because Brody, especially I mean, the the the, the crowd was waiting the entire, I mean, for the several, for the first several minutes to get going. And then when Jalen Moore had the back to back dunks, it got loud. It was really loud. The rest of the first half, early in the second half, it was really loud. But then Texas took over. Let's, let's talk about the three point shooting, Brody, because anybody that's watched us, we've talked about this over and over again. We've said if they cannot make threes consistently in conference play, they are going to struggle. That's exactly what happened last night. Four of 19 from the th from three and and to me Brody I think what was most discouraging is I thought they had some good looks I thought they had good looks and um you know and we've seen sometimes throughout the season that when it's when it's JV and McCollum you know if he's not hitting or maybe he's the only person hitting it's everybody else that struggles last night JV and McCollum won a six from three three of 11 overall I, I just you know, I was going through looking at OU stats this season, or especially in conference play, what they've shot from three. They have shot above 33% from three once in six conference games. The three-point shooting has not been consistent enough, whereas Texas not only hit timely shots, but they were consistent from three. I mean, they shot 44%. I just – you don't want to overreact. Look, OU's still 15-4. and four. 
Uh, OU is number 11 in the country. They're three and three in conference play. There's still a lot of ways to go, but how, how concerning is this outside shooting? Because to me, like you mentioned, I mean, that's, that's one of, Oh, you didn't hit enough shots last night. That that's what happened. They didn't hit enough shots. Yeah. And JV and McCollum, he, he's got to be better, um, especially in that second half. And I think one thing that's really challenging him is, you know, opponents are making it incredibly difficult for him to even get the ball and much less to get a three point shot off. So he's got to be more aggressive and go get the ball and go get a shot. And they got to make them. I mean, they did get good looks in that 10 minute stretch where they only scored six points. They were getting some good looks. They just weren't falling. You know, that's it's concerning to go 10 minutes in a conference game. And what was the, the crowd was amazing. That was a game that Oklahoma needed to win. And to just go 10 minutes and only score six points. That's definitely concerning. And, you know, there's other concerns. You know, Milos Yuzan and Javion McCollum, I think, are probably the two best players on this team. But they did not play like that last night. They neither of them not, you know, neither really was able to just get going in that game. Yuzan had foul trouble in the first half, which kind of only played 11 minutes in that half. And then McCollum, you know, he hit the second half. He had three points and it was just a three pointer that just kind of luckily bounced in. I don't know how that's not went in. I don't know how it went in either. So Jalen Moore stepped up and played really well. That's encouraging because he's kind of stringing that together. But at the same time, my complaint with Moore, he was 0 for 3 from behind the arc. And some of those shots, it it just seems like they could work it for a better shot. And maybe if they don't get a shot and it's late in the shot clock, then he takes that three. So that was the one negative for him. But maybe you got to get Darthard some more threes. I mean, he, he was he had that stretch where he wasn't shooting well, but he's, I think, two for two in his last couple games. You got to have someone be able to make threes. Is that Luke Northweather? I mean, I think he would not have had a great game with that matchup last night, but someone has to be able to shoot threes. You're not going to win games in conference play shooting 21% from behind the arc. I don't care what team it is. That, that's going to be incredibly hard to win games shooting like that. I'll tell you two things that I'm I'm worried about if if I'm an OU fan in terms of trends uh, the last few games and what it means moving forward. I, I think one, I mean, you mentioned early uh, bad starts have become a trend. This starting lineup it is not it's not working in conference play. It's just not. And I mean, you look at last night and and the end of that game kind of kind of skewed the plus minus numbers a little bit. But there was a point midway through the second half that everybody in the starting lineup was a minus a million it was the bench that had a positive plus minus everybody uh, john hughley Vado sorez latre darthard all had positive plus minuses uh I, the the starting lineup was not only bad in the first half last night they were bad in the second half last night too they were bad against kansas they were bad against uh they were they were really bad against tcu they were bad against cincinnati that's one thing and two Porter mentioned it after the game last night. The team looked exhausted, especially late in the second half. That's a concern. And you look at it, they were out-rebounded 40-24 to against a team that had been one of the worst rebounding teams in the entire Big 12 all season. Texas killed them on the glass, killed them in second chance points, killed them in the offensive glass. And that brings me back to a specific point, which is Sam Godwin has really, really struggled the last three games I was looking at his stats Brody he had four fouls in both of the last two games coming into Texas so he barely played uh he had he had two early fouls last night only played nine minutes I think in his last three games he's played 36 total minutes I think he has four points uh I I think he has two rebounds he only had one rebound last night the turn I mean he's turning the ball over you can't OU is not getting enough starting production or they're not getting enough production out of their starting center. And I think Porter Moser is clearly concerned about playing John Hughley extended minutes because of fatigue. You've seen this team go to, go to Jalen Moore more more at the five because of these issues. But Brody, I mean, this isn't just one game. Now we've got three or four games where, where Sam Godwin, it's just the production's just not, it's not only not there. If he's not getting offensive rebounds, if he can't stay out of foul trouble, he's hurting OU out there. How, how much is how much is that a concern? If you're an OU fan, what can he do to get back on track? And 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 if he can't, how does OU need to adjust? For him getting back on track, I think he needs to start coming off the bench, uh, because and you know 
that's just because of the foul trouble issues. If he he, it just seems like before the under sixteen timeout, he's already got one or two fouls, and they're not really. I mean, they're fouls that are ninety four feet away from the basket. They're just bad fouls, and so he won. Even if he was playing good, he can't stay on the floor because of foul trouble. And so I think one way that Moser could could help that would be to bring him off the bench and start Hughley. Um, and so it, with Godwin, he's going to play hard. You know you're going to get that. but And that was a bad matchup for him. But he's got to be better. You can't be the starting center and only play 11 minutes because not only is he putting Oklahoma in a bad position, he's putting John Hughley in a bad position because – Hughley, while I think he can really play a really solid 15 to 18 minutes, him playing 25 minutes or, you know, I, I'm not off the top of my head. I don't know how much it was last night, but I know it's against Cincinnati. It was 24. Big 20 it, last night. Yeah, it just seems like he needs a little bit more rest, and Godwin just needs to step up. And I think for Oklahoma, to me, they've got to go to Luke Northweather. You, that's just the position they're in. And there's matchups where – it's not really – and Tech is probably not a good matchup for him. But if he can hit some threes, they got to put him in and they got to play him with Jalen Moore because Moore, I think, has been solid at the five given his height. Um, he, he has a lot of athleticism. Last night they should have they should have put Moore at the five even more than they did. And they should have came out the second half and started him at the five. So I agree. Yeah. They should have put him at the five. I would have liked to have seen – or more. I would have liked to have seen them put Northweather at the four with yeah. him, with Jalen Moore at the five just a little bit. And just to specify, this is the last three games for Sam Godwin. Um, four total points. Uh, it's seven – or seven total rebounds, seven turnovers, and ten fouls. It's just – that's not going to cut it. And last night in nine minutes, he's in minus 11. You, you can't – that, it's just not going to work. It's not going to work. So now it puts Porter Moser in a predicament. How do you, what, how do you get Sam Godwin to be physical and play with energy, but also not get in foul trouble? Because once he gets in foul trouble, it put it puts everything out of whack. I, I don't know. I think that's going to be a question moving forward. I agree with you. I, I think we're going to have to see Luke Northweather more moving forward. I, I don't know, Brody. I, I, you don't want to overreact to a game like this too much, but at the same time, it was it was concerning to see OU just run out of gas. And we're six games into conference play, and they just ran out of gas in the second half. But you also have to give, to give credit to Texas, too. And this is what I was also going to mention, too, with someone like JV and McCollum or, or, or Los, or and I'm not trying to do a direct comparison, but you saw – Max Admus last night, 22 points, 8 of 14 shooting, 4 of 8 from 3, hit a killer deep 3 in that second in that second half from like 30 feet out, top of the key as the shot clock's winding down. Kind of just killed OU. I mean, I think that pushed the lead to 6. OU hasn't really had that kind of performance from a guy yet where Max just – Max was by far the best player on the game or was by far the best player on the floor last night. OU hasn't really had that kind of performance from somebody yet. And you combine that with OU looking exhausted, those are things I'm a little bit worried about if, I, if, I'm, an, if I'm OU. Yeah, it is clear they look exhausted. And as you mentioned, Moser said it, it's kind of a, you know, Tech coming in on Saturday, they're not going to be exhausted. They, they've had a week off. So um, I think Oklahoma really is going to have to think about, okay, how deep can they go? Because maybe you're bringing someone else off the bench. Uh, you know, Northweather, I think he, he should contribute some minutes. Maybe someone else could contribute five minutes. If they could have that at one, could just help guys not playing as many minutes, which maybe would bring, you know, the tired level down. But it, that is an issue. And I think I'm waiting for McCollum or Yuzan to have a breakout game. We just really haven't seen it in Big Gold play. Uh, I think both of them are – McCollum needs to adjust to Big 12 play because it's very clear he hasn't played in Big 12 play. Yuzan, he just hasn't taken that jump yet uh, because getting really similar performances from what he was doing last year, but where he does a lot of really good things, but he's not someone who's going to take over a game and go and get 20 points. So it, they both of them have to be way more aggressive. And people want to – you know, the high ball screen against Cincinnati worked really well. But against Texas, it didn't work really, work really well. And then on the, the other side, Texas just destroyed Oklahoma with the ball screen. 
I mean, that first half, they were just going to that side ball screen all day long, and it was working almost every single time. So, yeah, McCollum and Usain have to step up, and one of them has to be the, be the guy and, and go out there and get 20 points in a game. You mentioned it, man. Look, here's the thing. It, all of this that we're saying, it's not about sounding – the alarm bells. It's not saying every, everything's over. To, to me, the, only, the the main concern thing is, look, if, if you drop that game by a couple of points and it's just Texas shot really well, you know, they do they do a couple of things a little bit better than OU, that's one thing. I think the concerning thing is that they just completely dominated to end the game. How, having said that, it's not – we've still got plenty of season to go. OU was 15-4, and 3-3 three and three in conference play. They're still in a really good position. However – when you lose a home game against anybody in Big 12 play, it, it really puts pressure on you to not let that snowball. We've seen with OU what's happened when stuff starts snowball, snowballing the last couple of years. Now OU sits at 3-3 three and three in conference play. They welcome a Texas Tech team uh, into, into Norman on Saturday at 1 o'clock, I think, on ESPN+. Brody, Texas Tech's 15-3. and three. They're first in the Big 12. And this is a, this is a Texas Tech team. Uh, they're four and one in conference play. They beat Texas at Texas by eleven to open conference play. They beat Oklahoma State. They narrowly uh, edged out Kansas State. They lost at Houston in a blowout game. Hard to know how much stock to put into that. Last time we saw them, they beat BYU decently comfortably on Saturday. But this is this is a tough game. And this is where the concern level is. Is you get you can't overreact but if if you lose on saturday now you're three and four in conference play and when we look at how exhausted OU was in the second half it's not going to get any easier it's still a gauntlet moving forward so so brody heading into this texas tech game that you mentioned they're going to be well rested this is a texas tech team that you know they're they're kind of all over the place the offense hasn't been great for them this season they're middle of the pack they're ninth in offense they're sixth in defense. They're they're eighth in field goal percentage. They're you know they're they're middle of the pack in rebounding. They they don't do anything particularly well. It just seems like they're kind of good at everything. What what are you looking for out of this matchup? Yeah, Tech is a very good team, and that that was clear the second they went into Texas and won that game because they had a lot of different you know there was a lot of distractions going on when they won that game. But you know Tech. I don't think it's a good matchup for Oklahoma down low because they have Warren Washington, who's essentially, I think he's a seven footer. He's extremely athletic. He'll block shots. He's not a good matchup for Sam Godwin, but you know, he's at the same time. He's not Desu who's going to go out and beat you from behind the arc. They've got a lot of guards who can go out there and they're going to score. Pop Isaacs is one of them last year. He looked really good. And then uh, Joe Toussaint from uh, West Virginia. He's been really good this year. They've got chance McMillan. So, and they did lose one of their better players to injury, Cambridge. He's out for the year. But Tech, they're going to push the pace. And Oklahoma has kind of made it clear they want to push the pace too. But if Tech goes on a run, the Sooners are going to have to slow it down and someone's going to have to go get a bucket. Because Tech is just like Texas, their guards could go out there and they can – It's it feels like they can score at will. And so it's going to be an incredibly tough game. Anytime you give a Big 12 team a week to prepare for another team – that's going to make it even more difficult. So Oklahoma, they've got to they've got to find an answer offensively. That's the biggest thing. You can talk all you want about defending Pop Isaacs or defending Warren Washington or Chance McMillan, but it's not going to matter if Oklahoma gets that same type of performance they got out of McCollum and Uzan. Those guys got to step up. They got to go out there and perform. The thing that I'm I'm curious about, and one thing we should have mentioned in the in breaking down Texas is uh, turnovers have been an issue for OU all year. They weren't on Tuesday. OU won the turnover battle thirteen to seven, and won the points off turnover battle too. But they got beat up on the board so much it didn't matter. You look at this Texas Tech team. This Texas Tech team they they don't turn the ball over. They're second. Uh, they're set or they're second best in the Big Twelve in turnovers. They're averaging just ten a game. Uh, they they don't turn the ball over. So to me, you know, I'm looking at the turnover battle, but I'm also looking at the rebounding battle. This is a Texas Tech team, Brody, that's 13th in rebounds per game. They're 10th in opponent rebounds. They're they're 10th in offensive rebounds. This is not, again, like Texas, this is a Texas Tech team that doesn't rebound the ball super well. OU's got to win the rebounding battle, which again puts the spotlight on can Sam Godwin stay out of foul trouble 
what can John Hughley give them off the bench, assuming they, they stay with the way things are moving forward. And to me, because, I mean, you mentioned, you know, Texas Tech has some size, but to me, this has Luke Northweather written all over it. This has Jalen Moore at the five, bring Luke Northweather in. Texas Tech shouldn't kill you on the glass. This feels like a game to me where, oh, you can double down on on a little bit of, sm- a little bit of small ball and some shooting. That's To me, that this feels like the prime opportunity to do that. Yeah, Northweather at the four really matches up well. At the five, it's not so well. But like you mentioned, you want more at the five and Northweather at the four. That's probably the best way to go about it because Tex four, Darian Williams, is not particularly tall. I mean, he's on the smaller end for a power forward. Um, and so Northweather, if he can come in and shoot the ball well, that would definitely be huge. For Oklahoma, and he just brings a little bit of a different look offensively because they like to run the high ball screen a lot. And Sam Godwin, if he catches at the top of the key, he's looking to pass, nothing else. And John Hughley has been able to kind of do a little bit more stuff with the ball recently. But Northweather, he could come in, and I'm looking for him to, to step up and, and play well. And, you know, it's, it's just going to be a really interesting matchup. As you mentioned, they, they have to win the rebounding battle. And my question is, what what's the turnover going to look like? Uh, are they going to continue what they did against Texas and, you know, seven turnovers, not turning the ball over too much? Or is it going to come back and be another issue? And then a lot of it's going to come down to three-point shooting. you got to be able to make threes in the Big 12. You just have to. You can't shoot 21%. If they shoot anywhere near how they shot on, on last night, their Texas Tech will win the game. Well, that's the look. The benefit of winning at Cincinnati is you get a road win. Any win in the Big Twelve is is good, especially on the road. But the but the downside of it is when you lose at home, it feels like a big deal. This is an opportunity for OU on Saturday to bounce back, get a win at home, and prove to above five hundred in Big Twelve play. Move to if you know if they if they move to sixteen and four, they surpass last season's win total. That feels really good. They move to four and three in conference play. That feels really good. If you lose. All of a sudden, you're three and four in conference play. Now you're fighting an uphill battle. It's, this is this is a big deal. Uh, this is a big opportunity for OU. I'm curious to see what the crowd looks like. I, I was really impressed by the crowd last night. It's a Tuesday game at 6 o'clock. Yeah. yeah I'm, I was shocked at how many people came out. Now this is Saturday at 1 o'clock. I'm curious to see if that if that Tuesday letdown uh, it affects the crowd at all or if, if OU comes back or if fans come back out and watch this, because I'm telling you now, if OU wins, it's a big deal. If they lose, things things start to feel a little dicey, man. Don't don't you yeah. think? Yeah, that's when you start to – that's when you probably push the panic button because I believe they have two road games the week after. And we all know how winning on the road in conference play is. But, yeah, this is definitely a game that Oklahoma has to come out and win because if it doesn't, it just makes that Texas loss feel even worse. Dropping two games at home, can't have that. You got to get a split if you're OU. Just got to for for so many reasons. And it's that all comes Saturday at 1 o'clock at the Lloyd Noble Center on ESPN+. Plus. We will be here to break it all down over at OUinsider.com. Uh, Brony and I both for, for a big game for, for OU basketball. OU softball just right around the corner. We're two weeks away from the start of softball season. Junior day for football is coming up in just a couple of days. A lot of stuff going on over at OUinsider.com. You can also hit the like and subscribe button over the OU Insider YouTube channel. Plenty of things that you don't want to miss out on. Plenty of good content. Till then, we're going to see what happens on Saturday. We'll We'll be back next week on In the Paint to break it all down.